in the session with uh, my, my brother, so it's a point um, and just to ground the session, I'd like to do a what we call a pasha or an invocation or a calling in of spirit. So I call in the all encompassing source. I call in the waters of transformation. I call in the nothingness that which has no thing from which all things come. I call in the principle of unity, the oneness, the wholeness. I call in the principle of wisdom, that which allows us to intuit and to know. I call in the principle of destiny, the principle of all knowing, the principle of all power. I call in the principle of truth, of love, of interdependence, of interconnectedness, of interrelatedness. I call in the courage, the warrior, who protects love at all costs, forth from night into day, of enlightenment, of transcendence. I call in the principle of creativity, the principle of imagination. I call in the principle of communication. I call in the trickster the one who tests our hearts to make sure we're living according to truth. And I call in the great mother, the nurturer, the one who births it all. I call in all that we are, the great ones. I call in all the ancestors into this place. May they guide our conversation, may they guide our hearts, may we come together as one. To the family from our group, And with that, I'd love to call in uh, Tsepo, who will begin our presentation. Um, thank you, um, and thanks everyone for joining our session. For a strange reason, or I don't know if I would call it a strange reason, after, because I think we spoke, it was around June, about doing this session and one morning somewhere in July and you know I started to I just thought of putting down a poem something that I haven't done since university days my university days uh, I wouldn't say I was much of a poem writer but anyway let me offer my piece uh, which is linked to my my part of of the talk um, <clears throat> I don't have a title for it, but we'll just call it Where is God? Because that's the opening. Where is God? It seems to me that God is trapped inside specific books and buildings. It seems to me that in this modern era of tech, we have advanced so much that God can no longer be found in small wonders. God can no longer be found in the sprouting of seeds which give flowers and fruit to eat. God can no longer be found in the take of the flight and the landing of a sparrow. God is no longer found in the rising and the setting of the sun. This was my COVID experience. In science and technology, we trust. And God does not have a place here. All our side dishes, while we worry with the main dishes of survival and pleasure seeking. We are the walking and living dead, afraid to live and afraid to die. Maybe it's because we know God is dead in us and there's nothing left. We are to be used and discarded like condoms which are designed to bring pleasure without commitment or authentic connection between the users. We have reduced our recognition of God to meaningless rituals and something to call on when we face situations which we feel we are out of control. 
Otherwise, God can just chill and wait for the next emergency or crisis. We are out of touch with our godliness. God can no longer be found in the eyes or words of another, can no longer be found in the in-breath and out-breath. God is no longer found in nature and no longer found in us, which begs the question, but where is God? And whose responsibility was it to keep God here? So that was um, a little piece um, that I put together, um, which I feel probably it's, it's, it's the weight of the question. When we look around us, where is God? I think it's something that we need to ask ourselves. How did we even get here? Um, as a society, because when we actually look at it, it looks like God is outside of the education system and our spaces of learning. Um, and even though I use the word God, I think the more uh, appropriate or maybe useful word to use would be godliness. I just, you know, I'm just using the word God because maybe that's what we are mostly used to using. Um, but I, maybe if we were to use the word godliness, it would probably help us uh, in, in how we actually deal with our current situation. And when we look at our society, what kind of society then do, would we expect to have without godliness? Are we surprised with the society that we have? Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. So in our society, uh, uh, in, in I think can we can skip that one too. <laughs> oh yes, let me honor my lineage. Um, so the totems from both of my parents, from my paternal side, we honor the totem of the porcupine noko, and then on my maternal side. Uh, we honor the crocodile queen. Okay, so I wanted to then bring about that there are these terms that we use uh, in our language uh, here in South Africa. That we speak about Ubuntu as well as Ubuntu. Um, in the regular everyday use of these words, Ubuntu is interpreted uh, by you know as as a person, and uh, and Ubuntu um, is being loosely interpreted as meaning personhood. And it was quite astonishing that it was only late in my you know in my late thirties where I actually got to understand that actually no these words have a deeper meaning uh, than how we've been you know, growing up, knowing how to use these terms. And it's a learning that happened even outside of this um, schooling system, outside of the main uh, stream platforms. And is, you know, I think it's part of probably as the journey that I'm on, which took me to the spaces where such information was made available to say, no, actually, Muntu is not a person. Ndu in the word Muntu is actually the source of all. So Umuntu then would actually mean a divine being, you know, one who is you, so not every human being is automatically an Umuntu. It's really how you're going to live your life. Uh, to some extent, Umuntu it's like a state of godhood and how we actually get to live it. It comes through Ubuntu, which is, is what we will speak about in the next slide. Ubuntu itself, as I said, uh, it's not necessarily a seeing personhood. It actually looks at the interconnection, uh, interconnectedness of all. And it actually 
is looking at us living in accordance with the divine laws which recognizes this interconnectedness of all. So just these two terms, which we loosely have been using to define us as human beings or personhood are actually pointing to the divinity that's in us. Um, and therefore in a way telling us how we should be living our lives. And yeah, what I, I, as I said, I find interesting that yes, in the, you know, the mainstream and the education system, we we don't have these uh, these teachings. Then when I look at in my professional life, it was quite interesting. Then when I look at the something that I came across in my work, which I think it actually seems a bit linked to these teachings of Ubuntu, the interconnectedness. Uh, so there's a concept called systems thinking. So uh, um, this is something in the work that I do. So systems thinking is actually looking at the interconnectedness and the interdependencies uh, of, of, of systems. But what is interesting is, so this concept, which I say, I find there's a similarity between Ubuntu and it, uh, but it's actually in how it's been used. It's used within spaces that are concerned with making profit. And, and when you look at it in the social systems, it's around being used for, for political gains. But in how it's been conceptualized, there is a... Uh, when you look at you know the writings around systems thinking, there are there's a bit of shying away from recognizing the connection, the co our connectedness, the connection of all. In the work that I do, which is you know what I want to share, where I I came across this and I said, but this is similar to spirituality, even though it's used in this context. So it was made popular this uh, as well in my space of work. Uh, systems thinking by someone called Edwards Deming. So, and what I find interesting is that even this guy, Edwards Deming, he was advising, you know, these corporates, but they didn't necessarily like part of this message uh, because I suppose it didn't land very well with the higher ups because in part of the things that he used to say, some of his quotes speaking about systems, says, you know, the systems that people work in, they are count to 90. To 95%, you know, of the performance system will be the good person every time. So if you put a good person in a bad system, the bad system will no contact to that. People work in the system and is those who we've entrusted with the role of you know management and leading they are the ones who who create you know who built the system and when we then look at these things that he says it one of them he says each system is perfectly designed to give us you know exactly what we are getting today so when we look at poverty and inequality as well as the injustices that exist, then when we understand that we have, you know, societies that, yes, are not coincidental or accidental, they are actually a result of these systems that we have, which are systems that are devoid of the, div of the divine. They do not they refuse to see the interconnectedness of all. And I think it's because somehow those who are in the higher ups, they feel as long as they don't uh, experience the consequences of, of this brokenness, the consequences of this poverty, it's fine. But I think that means they are failing to see and to understand. And it was... In that line that I thought, there's even an interesting, even when you we, we look at 
uh, our our brothers who are in uh, uh, the Christian faith in the Psalms Psalms fourteen says something like the fool says in his heart there is no God. So there is no God when we then have to understand that you know there is the the law that governs all. So the ones who are overseeing this, they are saying, as long as there are no consequences. But it's not that there are no consequences. It's just that they do not see the consequences. Because even interestingly, even in this, in the same, you know, psalm, it says, the Lord, the second part of that verse says, the Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand any who seek godliness or who seek God. So I think because we live in this information age, we we are bombarded with information, but there is no understanding because information is external, but understanding is internal. So as much as you know, we we even even have these writings about systems thinking, and we we have you know, our higher ups who do not understand, who do not see that, actually everything starts with ourselves. If, for example, I act with violence on another, uh, if we understand that energy can neither be created nor create, uh, can neither be created, it can only be transformed. So it means inside my spirit, I had a wound that I then transferred to you through my act of violence. And then at the same time, after I transfer that, you know, that pain that I felt, and then I use my violence on you, then you then, you know, uh, you know, you have some form of pain and I have some sense of satisfaction. Um, but what I don't realize that in that violation, I have opened up a space that says the same violence that I could do onto the other, I open up that I'm also eligible to that same violence. And so then I live in fear that, okay, if someone else comes who can be more stronger than I and uh, act with the same violence, then I will probably lose my position of power. So then you then live with fear, um, always worried that somebody may come and topple you from that position of power. But then because you don't feel that poverty, the other things that you are presiding over, there is, you know, a sense that I got away, you know, a fool says in his heart, there's no God. I think it's, this is where I must send over to my colleague. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Brother Seppo and uh, Sister Rotendo. Um, wow, uh, I'm amazed at uh, the definitions that you, uh, you know, um, uh, helping us to remember and recall. Umuntu, gumuntu ngabantu, motuki motukabatu. Um, this forms that statement forms part of a, a very important aspect of really cultivating your divine self and you know why is it important for one to really cultivate their divine self why can't you just live and and be who you are so before i begin um i would like to honor my uh, ancestral lineage from my mother's side i am esparo tlantlahan and from my father's side kikwena yomudimisana morare so and just mentioning them, I invite them to the conversation. So today I'm going to be covering um, just the practical approaches to really realizing, you know, um, your divine destiny. Um, this is important because this is something that I also had to unlearn and relearn from the current system that we were brought up in. Um, um, so that I can really connect to my true self, um, which is devoid of um, the animal self. So if you can see on the main photo that has been shared in the presentation, there's a statement that says education is not the 
learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So this is such a powerful statement because then we have to realize that in our recollection of what we think is what we know. And, and in our thinking of facts that we actually think that we understand, we have to always question them. We have to go back um, to being re-educated because um, once you are re-educated, then you are able to understand the kind of world that you're living in. And this world basically has been created for us to really experience every aspect of it um, and also experience it by being free of doubt, by being free of anger, by being free of suffering. However, these are necessary tenets as well for the existence of a divine being in this reality so that you can grow and cultivate and challenge yourself so that you do not see yourself different from another. You do not see yourself different from a, a, a person um, that is sitting next to you. You do not see yourself different from the challenge that is being faced by someone who is in war. Um, by being empathetic, by connecting to everyone and everything and understanding that your contribution is uh, quite important to ensure that the whole is actually realized. Um, so I'm going to be touching on three aspects of unlocking the destiny. So it's realizing my divine destiny, taming the animal self and the unity of the whole. So you can move to the next uh, slide. Thank you. Uh, so so on this slide, what I would like to talk about is identity. Um, as, a, as a child, a young, a young boy who grew up in the townships and the city and the village, I had the privilege of actually seeing how, um, you know, the importance of actually knowing yourself is in these three stages. Um, continuously, you will be asked, who are you and why are you here? Um, you know, whether I'm meeting my grandmother or my grandfather or meeting my siblings or I'm meeting, you know, colleagues at school that I have not met before. Who are you and uh, why are you here? So each time, you know, I get that question, I always had a reflection to my person to say, you know, are they asking me my name? Are they asking me, um, you know, where I stay and why, what I'm here to do? Um, so I would usually present it in the way that we are taught, this is your name, and I'm here to learn, um, you know, not knowing uh, that there's actually more to the question. So as I come of age, um, I am called upon by the elders of my uh, village to actually sit with them and have a conversation about who I am. And all the while I thought, I know who I am. And this is my name and this is my lineage and that's who I am. Um, until an elder then posed the question to me to say, um, you know, who are you? Uh, and we're not talking about your name, you have a name. And we're not talking about your lineage, you have a lineage, but who is this person that has these things? This caused me to really go deeper and investigate, um, um, you know, who this person that I say I am and what I identify myself as um, 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 using some, some good African systems uh, that have been put in place for one to really um, investigate their true nature. So um, some of the important principles or, 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 or things that I've found to be helpful in my journey of knowing myself is observation. So the first thing is basically you just observe yourself, learn through seeing yourself, inner perceiving, so perceiving the person that you are from your inside, um, paying attention, um, you know, being focused to really seeing who you really are through your words, through your actions, through your thoughts, through your heart, um, intention. And also, I learned to listen to myself through learning, listening, uh, movement, energy, um, you know, dancing, uh, singing. Um, and also, I observed my person through 
doing, you know, what I was actively paying attention to um, by performing a task, whether it's a mental task, whether it's a physical task, whether it's a fulfillment of some sort. The observation principle is really key in realizing my divine destiny because through this, I then realized that there was a conversation happening inside of me. And this conversation is a key conversation that connects me to my true self, which is that that is experiencing life. And through this conversation, then I was able to say to myself, so if I say I have a name and I identify as this being, then who am I? And I realized at that point in time that I am awareness, I am consciousness, and I am here to really experience life through this vessel that I call the circle. So then after coming through this realization, then came a very important step as well, which is devotion. Now the devotion is not to this indwelling intelligence that I've just found, which is the consciousness that links all things and everything. This devotion is to higher principles, the principles that actually allow me to become a successful and honorable umuntu, a divine being in this life. So some of these principles really um, come from, from, from a number of things. So you would have um, a principle where you would uh, do your rituals, whether it's a personal ritual, a prayer, uh, uh, you know, every morning, every night, you would have a routine where you would perform a ritual. What is the purpose of that ritual? The purpose of that ritual is to have a conversation with this internal intelligence for you to really understand yourself, to really connect with this being that is living from inside us so that we can be able to um, be synonymous with each other. Because what I've realized as well that is that there are conflicts that will emerge when one starts to be away from this divine intelligence once you've found it. Um, unhappiness comes in, um, sadness comes in, and anger and so forth. So through ritual, through um, practice of ritual as a family as well, through practice of a ritual as a company, um, whether it be... Um, you know, through meetings, through um, the gathering of conversations and family, um, through conversations around the fire, um, dinner on the table. But that is a ritual that is important because then you can locate where one is in time and space, where one is in terms of mind and heart. And this is when then the third principle that I would like to share with you of manifestation also comes into play. So through devotion, because we are continuously performing this, this, this function every day with the clear vision of a certain ideal that one wants to achieve, which is the true connectedness um, with, you know, uh, Godhood, as my brother referred, then you then start to create a nature of yourself, which is always um, um conscious of the one who is self and also conscious of the one who is not self. And you also actively want to manifest divine joy. This is joy that has no limits. This is joy that will open up your, your, your person to saying, even though I'm going through challenges, even though um, my concept is not working, even though some other things are not really coming together, I am still peaceful. I am still one with the all and I will continue to create. So as my person, also as my consciousness and my intelli uh, indwelling intelligence uh, dictates. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so some of the tools are found really helpful to work with um, realizing, you know, my destiny, uh, that I always have to have the willpower and the freedom to choose um, 
you know, my actions, to choose my thoughts, to choose um, uh, ways in which I respond to challenges. I needed to also realize that leadership, I have to take leadership of this life. I have to be in front of the challenge. I have to be, you know, a visionary, uh, so to speak, so that I can rise to the occasion of really meeting what I am destined to achieve in this world. And what I am destined to achieve in this world is not just what I do, is not just what I say, is not just what I experience. It's the entire experience of life. Even going through the challenges is part of my destiny uh, because without pain, there's no gain. And um, this is where we draw insights from. So through this willpower, we have discipline and discipline basically then um, talks to purposeful actions. Um, we can all, you know, go through meditations. We can sit and do our visualizations properly. However, um, if they're not backed up by action, then, you know, the experience will be futile. It will be wishful thinking. So instead of um, just, you know, sending out to the universe that this is the Thing that you want to achieve you also need to be in that same space and time where that thing is supposed to be so that you can properly be positioned to attract and realize that potential and also discipline helps with dealing with some impulses as people we have uh, uh, blockers we have impulses so so um that discipline as well, that tool of discipline is enabling to be able to control and um, subdue some of the impulses that are negative and also strengthen the ones that are positive. And, um, and one of the tools that I also find closest to my heart is, is gifting and gratitude. We must always have time and space to share and gift and be thankful you know, for the love um, that we received from one another, from the love that we received from our community. And we must also be in a position to cultivate peace, even though emotionally that might not be um, a state in which you want to do it. However, you need to be, we need to be an agent of peace. And also be a channel or a key to delivering abundance. If you know a connection that will help a brother, if you know a connection that will help a sister, share that connection, um, you know, uh, open up that door so that the community can basically thrive in abundance. We've been taught that economics is lack and scarcity. Um, our school of thought, um, once you've connected to your indwelling intelligence, the source of all will show you that there's enough for everyone and enough of everything for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in light of time, I'm really going to be very quick on um, dealing with the animal self. Um, the, the key things, the key takeaways here is that, you know, the animal self is always empowered by expectation. It's always empowered by uh, blind spots and it's empowered by the ignorance of divine law. So with expectation, you'll have... Um, you know, situations where you expect someone or something to happen and um, it's an occurrence then create emotions of doubt, depression, disappointment, fear, and all those things, which is um, signs of the animal self. So with the blind spots, you can always find yourself criticizing something, you know, competing with something unconsciously or consciously so. And that means that you are, you are really blind to your divine nature and your person. So you need to really be able to see this when it happens so that you can then invoke the divine law, which will help to lighten and stabilize your heart, which will help to also create a peace in you that wants to experience the beauty of the world and the beauty of the people around you. And also, you know, provide you with clarity and wakefulness um, that your consciousness really needs for it to experience its divine self in this world. Uh, next slide, Nate. Thank you.
as 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 one is traveling through this um discovery of 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 really being a true umuntu or a true divine being you know one is driven with purpose you become purposeful everything you do has a reason and you understand the spiritual function for it whether it is just to say a positive word in the morning on your status whether it is to pour a libation for someone um, who's in in trouble that is speaking to your spiritual ten purpose and therefore um this is something that will basically uh, lift uh, our community to 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 higher states because when an individual is practicing and is experiencing their purpose and is living their purpose they are able to positively affect the community and once the community is positively affected we are able then to come as a collective and pull our resources because we're not coming in from a perspective of lack or uh, scarcity because we are abundant and we understand that we are all pulling from the same source the same divine being um um who's basically part of us and is interconnected with everything that is around us. Um, in collectively bringing our resources together, then we develop a vision and purpose, which then um, uh, leads us to have a positive uh, global impact and always um, sharing and um, gifting loving experiences to our communities and really um, leading an impactful life. Um, that is full of abundance and all. Um, so yeah, I think uh, in light of time, I'll end here and hand over to uh, Sister Rutendo, who will then take us through uh, the next part of our program. Thank you. Thank you so much to Tepo and Lisejo for laying the grounds about the bigger picture about the education system, having forgotten the divine, and then Lisejo going deep into how to cultivate that divine um, within. So as we have done, I would also like to honor my ancestral lineage and my totems from my paternal line as we are the people of the zebra, that which uh, is neither black nor white, but is both. And from my maternal lineage, um, um, my mother is Mifukeng, um, which is uh, the hare or the rabbit. But I also want to go back a bit further to my grandparents because uh, we only discovered today through uh, uh, explicating our totems that actually from my maternal side, um, we also have Mkwena, which is the crocodile. And so all three of us are actually related um, through uh, the totem of the crocodile. And then from my maternal grandmother's side, um, we have the eland as well. So I'd like to, just to go into just a moment of maybe co-imagination and co-reflection. And as we do this, what is a future? where we are educated towards our destiny. Perhaps it is not what the education system is at the moment, which is an education of dichotomy. It is an education of silos where everything is separated from the whole, where we learn science in the absence of the arts, where we learn geography in the absence of philosophy, where we learn maybe not a cultivation of self, as Nisejo uh, uh, and uh, Tsepo have said. And the result of this uh, education of the silo is that everything is mechanistic and deterministic. We're always reducing. Everything is subjected to objectivity and to dualism, to monism, to an inverted idea of natural selection. And everything is always about dichotomy and binary opposition. And when we're in dichotomy and binary opposition of the dominant paradigm, we're always in competition and we go back to that scarcity versus abundance. But what would happen if education was destiny, if it led us towards destiny? And in order to do that, I'd like to do the education of the oracle. In our indigenous African uh, perspectives, the oracle is key to anything we do because we assert that the are ways of knowing that we, with our small human minds, may not have access to. Now, on the right-hand side, we see the Ifa oracle um, of the Yoruba people. 
And, uh, and on the left hand side, we see our common computer system, which is made up of binary code ones and zeros. When you look at the auricular systems of Africa, here we have the Yoruba. Not only does it work in binary code in ones and zeros, but it also works in base four, it works in base eight, and it also works in base 16. So these auricular systems, which are able to see beyond that which is seen within the common eye, are actually very highly advanced sciences, which allow us to get into the education of the oracle. And once we are through the education of the oracle, the oracle would tell us what the education is that we are to exceed within the womb. And here I just want to, uh, uh, to credit uh, my brother Keith Barana for this um, painting that he did, um, where we realized that our original education is that which is, comes through when the sperm and the egg meet and consciousness starts to seed within us. And that consciousness is the consciousness that is going to become that which we are destined to become. So every heartbeat of our mother, every swirl of our amniotic fluid, every way that we hear the murmurs of life from within the womb, that is our original education. And then here I'd like to credit my mother who said, once you're through the womb, the original education from an indigenous perspective is the education of the hut. And the hut is made specifically of mud um, and of cow dung because that reduces us, you know, and allows us to get from the womb into a space that is womb-like. And in our traditional indigenous knowledges, conception um, or gestation is nine months, but you're truly born only after uh, 12 months because you spend three months within the confines of this hut with your mother. And, uh, and your mother is teaching you in the confines of this hut before the rest of the world have access to you. And from here, you then have the education of the breast. And here I have an interesting story of a, um, an, an incredible elder here in South Africa who asked me a question a couple of months ago. And she said, who do you credit in your CV or in your resume? And uh, she said, you probably credit your school, your university, the job that you had, but do you ever credit your original education? And this elder, she's a, 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 an incredible acclaimed artist has refused honorary doctorates from all the universities in the country. Because she says, until that piece of paper that you give me is able to take me back into consciousness, until that piece of paper that you give me is able to feed my community, until that piece of paper that you give me is able to create a better future, I do not want that honorary doctorate. And then she asked me, do you ever acknowledge the education of the breast? Is it in your CV that your mother fed you that original education while you were in the confines of that hut. And then uh, in uh, that hut, uh, the hut, the way it was uh, in, in indigenous, uh, from especially among the Basutu people, that hut would then in the first month, you're deep in the confines of the hut, in the second month of your life post uh, the womb, you are then within the alleyway, you know, where you're getting to become closer to the external world. And then from there, in the third month, you're then taken out into the balcony. And when your eyes are able to connect with the moon and accept the education of the moon, when you realize that I am because the moon is, and that the moon is my relative, then you are truly born into the world. And then your destiny is able to start accomplishing. And then you're able to become Mundu, as has been explained by the brothers before. And once you've connected with this moon, you are then introduced to the education of the elements. And so the baby is taken unto the rain so that they may feel what the rain feels like within their being and they may know it. And you're told you are the rain. The baby is taken over a fire so that they may feel the flames and they may know that you are the fire. The baby is taken into the clay because so that they could feel that they actually are the earth. And the baby is taken into the wind so they can know that they're one with the air. And when those elements are deeply ingrained in you, then you are truly Mundu. And from there, you are put onto the back because there is great education in the back, the back of your mother or the back of your grandmother or the back of your older sister or the back of your aunt. And this back, through the back, you are able to hear the distant cries of the ancestors. Through the back, you're able to connect with that which she's doing as she goes to the field and she plows, with the songs that she sings. 
you're able to be educated into what it means to be truly Muntu, but carried by the back of all the ancestors that have walked before you and all those that you are going to be an ancestor for who are going to come after you. And so there you get the education of the field, you get the education of the grains, you get the education of the waters, you get the education of all that is within the ground that nourishes and seeds life. You get the education in the plowing of the fields, you get the education in the harvesting. All of this is education that makes you mundu. And once you've done this and you've grown a bit older, then your mother or your sisters or your aunts, you know, are there to start plaiting within you the fractals of the universe. Because our hairstyles were then, as you can see, if you look at the hairstyle here, it is reflecting the corn or the sorghum or the grain that has been educated into you in the education of the field. And then this is further ingrained in you by the plaits on your hair, which are actually fractals that are woven so that you are within your true self, as depicted in the art within your hair, that which is depicted in the entire universe. The fractals, the patterns of the universe are ingrained within you. And once you've done that, then you can become into the education of the circle, where we realize that there's no beginning and there's no end between the ancestors, those who are present and those who are coming into the future. Where we sit in circle as we tell all the stories of the great ones that are able to seed us into our destiny now so that we're able to create a greater future. We're able to sit in circles that remind us that we're not in silos, that all things are connected. We're able to sit in circle and remember that ultimately anything that is a lion will eventually meet itself. So the circle is always about coming back to meet yourself. And once you have been educated into the education of the circle, you're then educated into the education of weaving, weaving the baskets, which having been woven those fractals into your hair, they are then woven into the baskets that you feed and give into the world, where you're able to see the stars and you're able to see the grains, where you're able to see the waters and you're able to see the depths into the caves or deep into the gurgling depths of the earth. All of these are woven into these baskets, which you learn to weave as you're learning how to weave life itself. And this is education. And then from the education of the, uh, the basket, you're then taken into the education of the pot. And here I actually have a pot made by my grandmother many, many years ago. I actually have it here within me, uh, with, uh, before me. And within this pot, my grandmother would first take the grandchildren to the earth because you have had all those elements ingrained in you as a baby. And she'll remind you that, remember, you are the earth. And so you're going to carve yourself here. And with that, she takes you into selecting the correct earth that will be able to create this pot. She's teaching you geography. She's teaching you geology. From there, she teaches you how to mix that earth with the water. Because remember, you're also the rain, you're water. So you're weaving yourself into this pot. And from there, she's teaching you, she understands the principles of biology, she understands the principles of chemistry, she understands the principles of mathematics, all which have been woven into this clay pot. And once this is woven in, it is then fired. Once again, remember your fire, you've been taken over the fire as a child, you know, but it is fired because you understand the principles of physics that are woven into this basket or that are molded into this basket. And once it is fired, and 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 then seal then you start to paint because ultimately we're all artists and in the, what we're painting as we see here with my grandmother's pot she's painting the principles of nature that which is amen the original root of consciousness which you will then live into your destiny and once that has been woven uh, and that has been done that work of art then it is placed on the fire with the water in and the cooking begins. And then you sit around the fire with your grandmother in that hut in order to be able to share stories, stories of the distant past, stories of the present and stories that have been received into the future. So ultimately our education system from an indigenous paradigm is inherently transdisciplinary. It is not in silos and it is an education system that reminds us of who we are and how we are going to live our destiny. And so from an African perspective, consciousness is education and therefore education must feed consciousness. And when we do this, we realize that we're tapping deep into indigenous knowledge, that which is its roots in a particular community and is situated within a broader social context in which all forms of life are a result of the interaction between social and spiritual relations. 
It is that knowledge which is tacit, which is transmitted predominantly orally, but also through initiation, through demonstration, through observation, as Nisirko has told us. It is that education which is experiential rather than theoretical. It is inherently interlinked to the understanding of the environment, and it is dynamic and constantly adapting. And when we do this, we find a unifying knowledge that brings universality. And this unifying knowledge is what we're able to root in what Sefo told us, which is Ubuntu, which is I am because you are, I am because we are, I am because all that is, is, I am because Neter, uh, which is all that is, is. And once we do this, we then move beyond what I call an anthropocentric Sankofa. Sankofa is an Akan principle from uh, the, the Akan people of Ghana, which tells us that we need to go back into the past, into the present, in order to be able to create a greater future. But what this principle, which is denoted just by this bird looking back on its back, is it's telling us the universe, that the universe is inherently about feedback loops, that whatever we feed back in creates that future. And though we, so we're always being told about feedback, whether it is positive feedback or negative feedback in our indigenous education. And once we understand this feedback, then we're able to sit in circle and understand the whole, the whole that sits around that tree, the tree which is able to take us through the various realms of being, because we see a tree as Muntu in our African cosmology, as opposed to a thing. And once we do this, then we may start to build multi-epistemological competence. We may start to be able to manage how to be in the spiritual world and as much as we are, I think all of us are engineers on this call, you know, um, as much as we are artists, as much as we are able to, to, to delve, um, you know, within, you know, all realms of being. And when we do this, then we go back and fetch it. We go back and fetch those knowledges that are able to create the future. When we go from Sankofa, we're then able to get into Ubuntu, which Seppo has talked about. Uh, which is the principle of interdependence, interconnectedness, interrelatedness in other cosmologies is called Ma'at. And when we're able to feed this, then perhaps we can become Benu. Benu is the phoenix, it's that which rises from the ashes. And when we rise from those ashes, then we're able to meet our destiny by going back into the past, seeding present in Ubuntu in order to be able to create a greater future. And when we do this, as the ancient uh, sand people say here in Southern Africa, we realize that it is our prerogative to dream, but a dream is not a dream until it is shared with the entire community. And when we do that, we're able to unlock destiny. So um, I think our session is almost over, but um, what we were going to do uh, from here, and perhaps uh, Lesejo can just take us through three minutes of just to ground that because we really don't have time, unfortunately, to uh, uh, to, to, to open up to share. Um, in a two-minute uh, meditation, just that we can take all that has been said, all that has been transmitted, and feed it into our consciousness until we meet uh, in the inner realms um, on the other side. Uh, Lesejo? Sister uh, Tendo, um, I would like everyone to be in a upright position. If you are sitting on a couch, please just sit a little bit uh, in front of it so that your legs have some room underneath, and also make sure you are uh, your back is straight. And I would like also the ones that are seated on mats and pillows for them to sit in a comfortable position with their backs straight. And I would like us to just do a small exercise that is going to basically help us anchor all this uh, knowledge about self-cultivation and also to help us to realize our destinies. And if we close our eyes and we start to do slow breaths, um, it's a small breath in, and a small breath out. So these breaths represent our true dedication and our true devotion to being divine. So I would like us to just do that breath, just a slow breath in. And out. And in. 
and out. As you're breathing in, you're welcoming all that is beautiful, all that is joyful, all that is amazing. And as you breathe out, you are taking out all that is heavy, all that is pain, all that is blocking the way to divinity. As you breathe in, you remember who you really were. You remember where you come from and you rise and smile. As you breathe and you realize that all is well, all is joy, all is love, all is caring, all is divine. And I would like you to just percolate for 30 seconds or so in the thoughts of a brighter future, in the thoughts of a better world, in the thoughts of an interconnected society, in the thoughts of a loving and caring nation, in the thoughts of warmth in our families, in the thoughts of warmth in our hearts, in the thoughts of caring, loving, and sharing that which is truly within us with everyone outside of us in joy and in faith and in love. Ashe. Ashe. We give gratitude and from all our ancestors, all our lineages, um, from here, from the southern tip of the African continent to wherever you are in the world, um, we wish you very well and many blessings. Oh.